Welcome to the services of Glendale Presbyterian Church, located at 9218 State Highway 83 North in Defuniac Springs, Florida. Sunday school is at 9.30 a.m. with Sunday services at 11 a.m. Wednesday night services are the first and third Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. You ever hear somebody use the phrase, that chapter is closed? That chapter is closed. Sometimes we use that phrase in the context of a, a job or career that we used to have. Or maybe it's a former relationship or even geographically, somewhere where you used to live and you moved on. And your mindset is, hey, that that uh, chapter's closed. It's in the past, and I've moved on from that. When I hear that phrase, sometimes I think about a certain sin I struggled with as a young adult. And uh, for me, my experience with that was three steps forward, two steps back. I would think I got to a point where I gained victory over that sin and I would make a promise to the Lord, never again. That chapter's closed. And then within just a few weeks, that temptation would come back around and then fall right back into that same sin. And I'd be miserable, beaten up on myself just weighed down with the shame and the guilt and I felt worthless. And that cycle went on for years for me. You ever feel like that? Defeated? Trapped? Well, in our scripture this morning, Peter's going to speak not only to the believers in the early church, He's speaking to all of us believers. He's speaking to those of us believers who still have that struggle with sin. And Peter knows firsthand how easily it is to fall back into temptation. And so in these verses, he's going to share a lot about volume one and volume two of a Christian's life. Volume 1 being our life before we came to know the Lord. And Volume 2, our life since we came to know the Lord. And what he's going to share is that there's too many Christians who should be living their life in Volume 2, but they keep drifting back to Volume 1 living. 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Peter writes, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that has passed suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the, in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you, but they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the same way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. And this is God's truth for us. And we should have ears and hearts open to what he has for us this morning. So let's uh, ask him uh, about that. Let's pray.
Father, I thank you that you uh, delight in confronting us with your word. Sometimes it's easy to swallow, sometimes it's not. But I pray, Father, that as your people, you will give us ears to hear and wills to obey the things that you have for us. May you be honored as we open ourselves up to you this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In these verses, Peter's going to be speaking about our experience, past, present, and future. Notice he begins in verse 1 by continuation of what he just talked about at the end of chapter 3. It's been a couple of weeks in, since we've been there. But he said, uh, therefore, linking it back to what he's just said, he said, since... Uh, Jesus uh, suffered in the flesh. And that original language, when he says suffered, it indicates once for all. One time, just like we talked about in chapter 3, verse 18, that when Jesus died, it was a sacrifice sufficient for all time. It didn't have to be like those Old Testament sacrifices that kept having to be repeated. And Peter says, in light of that, we are to arm ourselves in the same way of thinking that Jesus had. He uses that imagery of a soldier preparing for battle. And Peter says that battle begins in the mind. Having the mind of Christ. And you know that's the same truth Paul shared in, to the church at Rome in Romans 6, 7, and 8. Part of that scripture we used for our opening scripture this morning, where Paul says, when we were converted, we died with Christ. We were uh, spiritually dying with him, our old nature. But then he says, when Christ was raised, we were raised with him to new life. We were given a new nature. And Paul says, and Christ won the victory for us. That's what Peter's saying. Does that mean we're done with sin? <laughs> you know the answer to that. No, we're not done with sin. Both Paul and Peter address that. We experience victory over sin positionally, but practically, day by day, we still have to deal with our sin nature, with that old man. And we'll will continue to have to deal with that old man as long as we occupy these bodies of ours. Peter's saying our, the things of our sin nature, that's volume one living. And we should put that chapter in the past. R.C. Sproul relates this to World War II. He writes... That in World War II, in one sense, spiritually, for us, D-Day has already taken place. Historians tell us that when the Allies landed at Normandy, Normandy in June of 1944, it marked the beginning of the end of World War II. And yet, there were still more battles to follow, including the Battle of the Bulge, one of the bloodiest of that war where the Third Reich made their final stand. R.C. says, our conversion is like D-Day. The outcome of our spiritual future is no longer in doubt, but there's still battles to fight. Right around the corner, our enemies, who Christ subdued and defeated at the cross, as long as they're able, they're still going to bring the battle to your doorstep and to my doorstep. And to win those battles, Peter says, we need the mind of Christ. So if you're a believer, Peter's counsel to us is this. Don't be tempted to go back to volume one living. That victory's already been won. Keep claiming that victory on a daily basis. When you wake up in the morning, think about that. 
and the victory that is ours as we claim that victory. And remember, he's writing to Christians, Peter is, who's under, they're undergoing all kinds of trials and suffering we've been talking about. They're very aware that some among them have already been killed for their faith. And that's why he says, I believe in verse 1, whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. What's he talking about? That word cease is in the perfect tense in the Greek, which means it emphasizes a permanent condition. Permanent condition. The ones who he's writing about, they're free from sin once and for all. He's talking about believers who have died. They suffered in the flesh and they died for their faith. He's talking about martyrs. They have already won the battle. They're done with sin. You see, for believers in Jesus Christ, the worst thing that can happen to you is the best thing that can happen to you. If we know Christ, and life is good, but when we die, Life gets so much better. That's why the Apostle Paul said, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. So living in victory right now, day by day, is based upon what Jesus has already accomplished for us in the past. Now Peter's going to deal with our present Verse 2. So to live for the rest of your time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Somebody asked you the question, hey, how you living? How you living? How are you going to answer that? <laughs> Peter says, from this day forward to the end of our life, we should be living our lives for the will of God. Because we're still in a battle. And we must choose every day whether we're going to live in victory or live in defeat. Somebody said, today is the first day of the rest of your life. That's profound, isn't it? But it is, if you think about it. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. And you can choose whether you're going to live in volume one or volume two. He calls volume one their human passions. Or he says you can live in volume two in the will of God. And since we know what the future holds, and we know as believers one day we're going to be given a new body, free from pain, free from suffering, free from sin. Peter's saying that we should live the rest of our time here on earth in pursuit of that kind of holiness. These Christians that Peter's writing to, these Gentiles, they knew all too well what their former life was like. But notice Peter spells it out to them in graphic detail. Verse 3. When he says, this is what the Gentiles want to do. Living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. You know what that reminds me of? Mardi Gras on Bourbon Street. You see, I've known both of them. I, I knew as a kid growing up, I knew what Bourbon Street was like in the daytime, and I knew what Bourbon Street was like at nighttime. But I also knew what Mardi Gras was like for three weeks out of the year. But you put the two together, And it's so much worse now than it was when I was a kid growing up in the 60s and 70s. Peter tells these Gentiles, that's what your time was like, your life was like in the past. But notice he says, 
for the time that is past, that is volume one living, for the time that is past, suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. And another translation makes it so much more clear to me. Another translation reads like this. You have spent quite enough time doing these things. That's what Peter says. You Gentile believers, you spent quite enough time in volume one. And now it's time to put that behind you. That chapter needs to be closed. And for every believer, including you and me, that chapter should be closed in our life. And we should be known for a life, living a life pleasing to God and for doing His will. Is that how you're known in the circles that you travel in? The people in your workplace and your community and even in your family gatherings? Do they know that you are a person whose, whose life is living for the will of God? Because once you begin walking the walk and once you begin talking the talk, you can expect opposition. Verse 4. Peter says, with respect to this, uh, to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the, the same flood of debauchery. R.C. Sproul shares how when he was first converted, he wanted to go and tell his buddies about Jesus. And so when he came home from college, he went to see, he went, he went to visit them. And they, when they saw him coming, they were like, man, we're, we're going out and party again. Come on. They wanted to keep doing those same things. And he told them he could no longer participate with them. And when they asked him why, he said, look, I've become a Christian. And he wanted to tell them about his experience. He wanted to tell them how Jesus changed him. And you know what they thought? They thought, man, you're crazy. They didn't like it. They didn't like that he wouldn't go party with them anymore. And they walked away. And if you live your life like that, you know what? We can expect to lose some so-called friends along the way. And Peter says, they will even probably malign you. They just don't get it. When you take that kind of a stand. But here's the thing. Don't fall into the trap of being so overly concerned about what they think. You know what's important more than anything? What God thinks. Notice verse 5. They will malign you, but also they will give an account to him who's able and ready to judge the living and the dead. You remember what Peter said at the end of chapter 3? That when Jesus ascended back to the Father in heaven, it says he sat down at the right hand of the Father. He sat down on his throne and he reigns from there. And not only does he reign from that throne, one day he will judge from that throne. And Paul writes to the church and, uh, in Rome and he says, at that judgment, all miles that are doing this will do this, will be closed. And at that judgment, the only thing that matters, the only issue is, what did you do with the gospel? What did you do with Jesus? So if there's any among us, any in the hearing of my voice, and, and you've never done that, you've tried your best to, to be, be good and earn favor with God, but you've never come to a point, to the end of yourselves, where you say, you know what? I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. That's my only hope. I need to put my trust in Him. And if that's your experience this morning, our prayer is that you'll, your eyes will be open to that truth. And you'll turn from your sin to the Savior. If that's where you are, 
I'd love to talk to you about that sometime. And for all of us believers among us, maybe some in here that are struggling with going back to volume one living, those temptations keep coming up. I want to encourage you to embrace that truth that Peter shares that victory is ours. We can claim that victory every day until he comes. And when he comes and we stand before him, as believers, we'll have to give an account for how we live. Volume one's in the past as far as God's concerned. That'll never be brought up again. But how we're living our life in volume two, I believe we will give an account for that. Peter says in verse six, for this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. What does he mean that the gospel was preached even to those who are dead? I believe he's referring to those who were alive when Jesus was on earth and Jesus preached to them and they believed the gospel. But now, by the time Peter's writing, some of them have died, including those who have been martyred for their faith. They were the ones judged in the flesh, the martyrs. That's when he says... They were judged in the flesh, but now he says they are alive in the spirit. You see, for them, the battle's over. The victory's already won. And, and they're going to stand as we will stand one day before the Lord, before that throne. And as we think about that, let's be prepared to give an account for how we lived our lives in volume two. Not meaning that we were sinless. No, no, no. But rather, our goal, our desire was live a life pleasing to God. We were good stewards of what has been entrusted to us because we don't want anybody, especially the Lord, looking at our life and saying, and what a waste. What a waste. John Piper writes this. He says, I'll tell you what a tragedy is. I'll show you how to waste your life. He said, consider the story from Reader's Digest, February 1998. A couple took early retirement from their jobs in the Northeast when he was 59 and she was 51. And now they live in Punta Gorda, Florida, where they cruise on their 30-foot trawler and they play softball and they collect shells. He said, picture them before Christ at the day of judgment. Lord, look at my shells. That's a tragedy. He concludes with this. He says, God created us to live with a single passion, to joyfully display His supreme excellence in all the spheres of life. God calls us to pray and think and dream and plan and work, not to make much of us, but to make much of Him in every part of our life. Brothers and sisters, don't waste your life spending it away on things that don't matter. But rather, invest your life, invest your time, invest your resources in things that do matter and things that do last. Quit living your life in volume one. Because the sin that used to be part of our life, that chapter should be closed. Live your life in such a way that pleases the Lord so that one day when we stand before Him, some of us will hear those words, good job, well done.
Can you say with the Apostle Paul this morning? For me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. Pray with me, please. Father, I pray that as we, your people, hear the words that Peter wrote for those Christians, but the same words the Holy Spirit intended for us, I pray that we will understand and apply those truths to our lives. Because we all struggle. We can put on good happy faces sometimes, but we all struggle with sin. And we'll continue to do that. Thank you for the victory Jesus has already won over the enemy. And we look forward to that day when the battle will be over for us. But until that day, Father, give us the grace to walk day by day in victory. To claim that victory you have for us. Help us to come to an end of ourselves and to realize greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Help us to live and for the will of God. Give us the grace to do that, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.